Pokemon Emerald's Battle Factory is the hardest vanilla challenge in any Pokemon game. It's not a ROM hack, it's not a Nuzlocke, it's not a Nuzlocke of a ROM hack, it's one of seven facilities located in Emerald's post-game challenge, the Battle Frontier. What makes the Battle Factor unique among these is it's the only facility where you don't bring your own team, instead being forced to choose three Pokemon from a random selection of six and then take on a gauntlet of seven trainers. Once you beat the seventh trainer, completing the round, you repeat the process again, with the difficulty quickly increasing. As recently as two years ago, nobody had even breached 100 wins in the factory, while other facilities like the Battle Tower had world record streaks over 3,000 wins. Many deemed 100 wins to be impossible until Battle Factory legend Wildcat Formation smashed this notion by posting an unreal streak of 119 wins, destroying the previous record of 85. I've always loved Pokemon Emerald, and after spending years exploring Gen 3's weird competitive metagames, I came across the Battle Factory in a chance encounter. He has failed to click mirror coat. Let's go. That's round one, baby. Round one is done. I became fascinated with the ins and outs of such an unexplored and grueling challenge. And in this fascination, I found Wildcat's iconic world record. I dedicated myself to beating that record with many. Oh, that's so devastating. Many. <laughs> failed attempts along the way. This is my journey to beat 119. After so many attempts, rounds one and two become quite straightforward due to the dumb AI. I don't even take the time to update my current streak because with enough experience, making it to round three is a given. Yeah, so rounds three to five are pretty boring. Let's get to an action-packed round six. Man, that's my elevation. Ew. Ew. Not as ew. Yeah, this draft wasn't the best. Many of you might have been pogging at seeing Spore Focus Punch Breloom, but Jimmy the Cool is here to explain why this is not insane. Breloom is one of Gen 3OU's defining offensive threats. With access to the ever-valuable Spore, a 100% accurate sleep move, Stab Focus Punch to punish whatever switches in, and also access to Mark Punch, making Breloom one of the few good priority users. This Pokemon is a momentum generator and wall breaker that can enable offensive team styles. However, Breloom has not seen as much success in the Battle Factory. Lumberry is a very commonly used item in the Battle Factory, making Spore unreliable. And since the AI very rarely chooses to switch out, Focus Punch is not a very reliable move either in this environment. Subscribe to the LRXC channel to prevent the future paradox form of Avalug, Iron Thugulus, from creating an avalanche of problems for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Anyway, I decided here to take a draft of Mr. Mime, Fortress, and Kangaskhan, passing up on a pretty good Crobat. Mr. Mime makes sense with Psychic Thunderbolt coverage, and with its Trick Choice Band gimmick, I figured it could find scenarios to help Kangaskhan get in freely, especially since it baits Shadow Ball. Fortress makes sense as well with its great defensive typing, and access to one of the best moves in Factory, Explosion. Being able to guarantee a win when you have two Pokemon and the enemy has one is incredibly useful along with being a safety net versus the plethora of threats that take down Mr. Mime and Kangaskhan. This is why I never lead with my explosion Pokemon. I think of it as a tool to respond to an unknown threat in the back, and if the lead is the threat, I can just switch Fortress in and click Explosion there anyway. Finally, Kangaskhan, while having a weird looking set, still provides fast Earthquake and Endure Reversal, which is the win condition my subpar team needs. Midway through this round, I decided to swap my Mr. Mime for a Choice Band Slaking. This is easily the best slaking set because with powerful coverage and max bulk, only being able to move every other turn due to its ability truant isn't that big of a deal, or is it? We're going slaking here. Slaking, where's the slaking spam everybody? I'm waiting. School Kid Megan brings out a demonic Skarmory set that my team seemingly has no answer to. Rocking Curse Toxic Fly with Resto Chesto and Maximum Special Bulk, this Pokemon can get out of control fast when you lack strong special attacks. And a Thunderbolt coming off of a base 40 special attack Kangaskhan is definitely not going to be strong enough. 
Staying in with Slaking was obviously not the play, as I was locked into using Earthquake due to my choice band, and Skarmory is immune. Going into Fortress and clicking Explosion, then trying to revenge with Slaking is tempting, but Skarmory is almost guaranteed to use Curse here on the Switch, neutering the big damage that Explosion could have done to allow for the Slaking revenge. And while Kangaskhan could 3-hit KO with Thunderbolt after that, when Skarmory dips below 60% health, it's almost guaranteed to use Rest, and then I would have wasted my Fortress for nothing. My plan was to go to Fortress here to not let my Slaking or Kangaskhan get toxic for no reason, as it could still click Toxic here. With Scar Skarmory setting up a curse on Fortress, I decided to allow Skarmory to set up as many curses as it wants, and the moment it decided to fly in the air, I switched to Kangaskhan, living the plus 5 fly. With Kangaskhan at this range, Skarmory sees a kill with fly, meaning it will never try and toxic me. And because fly is a two turn move, I can always endure on the turn Skarmory hits me with fly, Thunderbolt on the turns in between, and we have ourselves a sneaky victory. <laughs> that was the last Pokemon. So then after beating a team of Marowak, Typhlosion, and Snorlax later this round, I'm on to the final battle of round six. So there's someone that LRXC forgot to tell you about. The Battle Factory boss, Nolan. Nolan shows up every three rounds as the final battle. And after you beat Nolan the second time on round six, you get awarded the knowledge symbol. Now, as LRXC will tell you, this is where most trainers leave the facility and consider it beat. But real gamers know that what makes Nolan so difficult is that he uses perfect stat Pokemon. Now on round six, you don't have perfect stat Pokemon yourself. You also don't know if he has a lot of Pokemon of the same type. He can even ignore species class. So if you have a Charizard, he can have one too. It's crazy, right? Thanks, Point Crow. So right now I have a Fortress and Kangaskhan with pretty good stats, but also a Slaking that has, that's right, three IVs. This is the main reason I chose not to swap any of my Pokemon, because even though Marowak, Typhlosion, and Snorlax are great Pokemon, they also only have three IVs, as every trainer not named Noland will have three IV Pokemon, creating an interesting risk-reward dynamic with swaps. Let's see how the battle turns out. Firo is one of the least threatening Pokemon in Factory, but Firo's set here is actually slightly awkward. Slaking does win the 1v1 in theory, living three frustrations and revenging back with two aerial aces or brick breaks, but this Firo is equipped with scope lens, making all of its moves have a 1 in 8 chance to critical hit, which is pretty high, and I don't want to lose my Slaking. I could have gone to Fortress, but again, Fortress only 2 KOs Firo with Rock Slide, and I'd have to dodge a critical hit in 3 turns, hit both of my Rock Slides, and I'd have my slow explosion Pokemon at low health, making it unlikely to live a follow-up attack from a Pokemon in the back. So with my stat disadvantage, trading my Explosion Mon for a Firo was a no deal. In the end, I decided I wanted to chip the Firo so that Kangaskhan could set up an Endure Reversal kill and hit whatever comes in hard after Firo. You packed instead? Oh, they saw a crit. No, they didn't. What? That's bizarre. Huh. First off, the AI never sees a crit, so I don't know why I said that. Second off, this was really puzzling at the time because the AI should literally never go for Drill Peck if Frustration always did more damage. By the way, ignore the fact that the calc says return, it's always frustration. Anyway, what's happening here is really interesting. Frustration in the Emerald AI is considered a power one move. These are moves that are designated as having a power one in the code because of their variable damage. Examples include reversal and flail because their damage depends on the Pokemon's HP, hidden power with its IV quirks, and even magnitude with its random damage. Hilariously, friendship-based moves like frustration and return are also lumped into this category, even though every Pokemon in the factory has minimum happiness. Which makes sense if you think about it, as researchers have caught all these Pokemon only to be used as experiments in a factory on an island far away from their home. Anyway. This means that Firo here will literally never click Frustration when Drill Peck does solid damage because Power 1 moves are discouraged. This ends up mattering here as when I switch to Kangaskhan, Drill Peck puts me in an awkward situation where, where Frustration would almost always kill me, yet if I endure and they Drill Peck, I can be put at an HP where my reversal isn't at max power, meaning it's not a guaranteed kill on Firo. Thankfully, I get the roll in my favor on Firo and promptly take out the garbage team of Jinx and Shiftry in the back, and we have ourselves an easy Noland victory. On round 7, I had quite the interesting draft. It started off pretty bad with this awkward Nidoking set, a weird Walrein set, and the infamous Zatu. <laughs> How do you guys always summon Zatu? 
but the back half was pretty solid with a Leech Seed Toxic Ludicolo, a fast offensive Charizard, and the best Shuckle rocking Toxic, Double Team, and Rest. I knew that my upcoming opponent specialized in water types, so Ludicolo was an obvious pick. This set is devious with Leech Seed plus Toxic to wear down the opponent and provide healing for my teammates, and it's a surefire answer to almost every water type. It was the perfect support lead. Charizard was also a Pokemon I had to take. It provided the speed and instant power this draft sorely lacked, and I was confident it could clean up teams in the back. I actually wouldn't have minded taking Zatu, as it helps Ludicolo's weakness to grass types and poison types while beating Heracross, but it overlaps in utility with my Charizard. Nor would I have minded taking this Shuckle as I've beaten around with it before, but having two Pokemon with their only attacking move as Toxic was just asking to lose the poison and steel types. So this is why I settled on Walrein as my last pick. As with Stab Ice Beam, I give myself extra insurance versus the grass types Ludicolo loses to, and Double Team plus Curse and Earthquake can always get some cheeky wins. Thankfully, after the first battle, I got to swap Walrein for God Lapras. With max HP, max special attack, and great coverage, this Mon is a beast. And mine having shell armor was extra cool, making it immune to crits, adding to its reliability. Then, I swapped Charizard for a Dragon Dance Gyarados, and we entered a tumultuous fifth battle, where Whiskash of all things gives us trouble. I go to Gyarados on a potential fissure and attempt to Dragon Dance and rest, but get frozen in the process. This was undeniably terrible, and I had to figure out a way out of this. You might think I can just go into Ludicolo and 1v1 the Whiskash with Toxic and Leech Seed, but Fissure destroys Ludicolo. While Double Team does boost my evasiveness, Oko moves like Fissure ignore evasiveness, meaning they are always 30% accurate, acting as an interesting way to balance the power of Double Team in Battle Factory. My odds of dodging 5 Fissures were a mere 16.8% chance, and I didn't want Ludicolo to get frozen by Ice Beam, so I decided my path was to switch stall between Lapras and Gyarados baiting Earthquake and Fissure while Lapras is in, and then baiting Ice Beam when Gyarados is in. Rinse and repeat. Oh, why did it surf there, you little monster? Oh, it doesn't know I have Water Absorb. So what happened here is that because Lapras can have two possible abilities, Shell Armor or Water Absorb, the AI guesses every time which ability I have and knowledge is erased whenever I switch out. And because Gyarados intimidated Whiskash a couple times at this point, it guessed I had Shell Armor and surfed instead of Earthquake on Lapras because it potentially did more damage. Now, I can't keep switching in Gyarados because it can slowly die to Surf or die to a Surf crit. And if I lose my Gyarados, I lose my Ground Resist, making Fissure a huge threat. So how do I make my switch stalling sustainable? By playing aggressive and going to Ludicolo to Leech Seed risking a freeze on switching and a fissure on my Leech Seed turn. After hitting the clutch Leech Seed, I decide to swap around with Gyarados and Lapras to heal Gyarados up, and with the Leech Recovery, use it as an opportunity to try and thaw with Gyarados. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen, and right before Whiskash dies, I decide to swap out into Ludicolo to not only preserve a potential Intimidate I may need for a Pokemon in the back, but if a setup Pokemon comes in on Gyarados, Gyarados could give that Mon free setup, because it is frozen so Ludicolo is a much more proactive play. Ludicolo proceeds to 1v1 a Hypno, and the ever-deadly Kingdra shows up in the back. This is a scary set, quite similar to Gyarados in that it has Dragon Dance, Resto, Chesto, and attacking moves in Double Edge and Ice Beam. Thankfully, Ludicolo can just set up a Leech Seed, and with a Strategic Intimidate, I can go into Lapras and 1v1 it, not scared of a crit thanks to the godlike ability Shell Armor once again. And the powerful Mono Water Team then cleans up the round quite easily, and we are on to round 8. Before we even start round 8, Battle Factory speedrunner Accolade is here to explain it. Round 8 is where things get difficult. I actually wouldn't know. I've been speedrunning the factory for about 3 months now, and I can barely get past round 1. But up until this point, we knew with 100% certainty what each Pokemon's items and moves would be. For example, Zatu 1 will always show up on round 4, Zatu 2 on round 5, and Zatu's 3 and 4 on round 6 and 7. But now on round 8, it could be any one of those Zatus, and on top of that, there's legendaries that could pop up at any time and threaten to end the run. You might also be wondering at this point why LRXC is doing level 50 instead of level 100. That's because while in the level 50 category, sets start to become unpredictable in round 8, in the level 100 category, that gets turned down to round 5. In the level 100 category, there's also Tyranitar and Dragonite sets to worry about, which don't show up in the level 50 category. Thanks, Akko. So, I got a pretty sick draft. 
First off, I got a Latios with dual stabs and Thunder Wave and paired it with the same Charizard from last round as it helps with Latios' crippling weakness to Ice and Steel types while giving me more immediate power. And while the Aerodactyl set and even the Umbreon set aren't the worst, I decided that Ursaring gives me some immediate physical power helping my team's Blissey and Snorlax issues, even if the set is pretty bad. I think usual draft logic would have had one lead Latios here to set up Thunder Wave for Ursaring in the back, but because Latios is my best Pokemon, I don't want to lead it into a bad matchup and have to switch in Charizard or Ursaring, two Pokemon not very well known for their defensive utility. Furthermore, I think a great strategy to adopt is what Pokemon do I want to rely on in the back if I'm forced into a 1v1 scenario? And for me, that was Charizard or Latios, so lead Ursaring it was. After Latios finishes Ursaring's job of beating Latias, Snorlax comes in, which is absolutely nightmarish. Not only does it have eight different possible sets at this point, but I'm left with only special attackers. I have to use Luster Purge to fish for the special defense drop, which I get, Dragon Claw it for Chip, and pray that Charizard can get the job done. Technically, it can be Snorlax 3 or Snorlax 5 here, the only two sets with Mega Kick, which is great as it's an inaccurate move, but both Mega Kick sets also have Quick Claw, which is an item that grants the user a 20% chance to move first every turn. Oh my god, thank goodness. Bro! No. Oh. Next time in Blaze, please, fucking hit it over here. Oh my god, it wasn't. Okay. Oh my god, this game. Okay, I can overheat and I kill it. I'm pretty sure. Snorlax 3, this can't be Quick Claw. Not that there is any Quick Claw. Okay, I'm just overheating. Un oh! oh, it thundered. It thundered, it thundered, it thundered. It thundered, it thundered, it thundered. It's Ampharos 1, it thundered. Please, bro. Like, you can't do this to me, or else I quit Pokemon forever. Yes, man. I was winning the whole time. I was winning the whole time. Why were you guys stressing, bro? Why were you guys stressing? I literally won. It's okay, I won. After that insane battle, I obviously swapped Ursaring for Snorlax. And with the amazing team of Snorlax, Latios, and Charizard, I destroyed round eight. Round nine is objectively the hardest round in Battle Fact. I made a video explaining why that you should watch for more info, but long story short, a lot of the Pokemon in my draft have random IVs when they should have perfect IVs. Oh, and it's also a Noland round. Funnily enough, we had the hilariously bad Ursaring 6, which we lovingly call Freddy Fazbeam as the last Mon in the draft. Previous world record holder Wildcat has an interesting affinity for this Ursaring, and while he tried to get me to use it, the path here was clear. I'll use the Espeon set as a lead for fast instant damage, potentially being able to charm or calm mind pass to give Registeel a head start versus something, while also helping Scout potentially threatening sets for the robot. Registeel is a very cool win condition here, and while it is crit prone, Steel types are too good, and I definitely need to use it as a pivot in the back, with Aerodactyl cleaning up teams quite well with its double edge plus earthquake coverage. Registeel shows its power in the first battle using Firo as setup bait, and after intelligently scouting to see if Miltank had counter Counter, I PP stalled it out of counter and took it and Gengar out in the back. The next battle, I dismantled a Regice, and this left me at a tough swapping decision. Aerodactyl did give me speed, power, a ground immunity, a fire resist, as well as great IVs, while Regice gave me a bulky Pokemon with Bolt Beam coverage, along with the best move in Factory, Rest. While Regice isn't immune to ground, it can threaten ground types harder with a Stab Ice Beam, and Espeon can handle most fire types bar Hound Doom. Most of you may be thinking I should keep the Aerodactyl, but I actually swapped for Regice because I took into account what the scientist said before I entered the battle. And I figure this is a great time to briefly talk about it. The scientist will first tell you if the opponent specializes in a specific type, and if they do, they will guaranteed have two Pokemon that have that typing. If the scientist doesn't reveal any typing, they most likely don't have two Pokemon of an identical type. Here, the scientist tells us the ultra rare type specialty, Ice. Furthermore, the scientist gives you a battle style, and this tells you the sorts of moves you can expect from the enemy's team. In this example, the scientist tells us high risk, high return, which means the enemy's team will have two or more risky moves. Examples include Oko moves like Horn Drill, self KO moves like Explosion, or even stat decreasing moves like Overheat. This means I am likely to face one of the Water Ice type trio of Dugong, Lapras, and Walrein. 
They are very likely here, and they have Oko moves like Sheer Cold, Horn Drill, and Fissure, along with Great Bulk and sometimes Quick Claw, making them my primary concern here. This is why Regice, while having less defensive synergy with my team, was the play I needed to make, because in the factory, you have to play for the present, not try and create the best team for the future. Here, my opponent leads a Hariyama, which is beautiful for Espeon, as now I have a 3-2 Mon advantage versus the two Ice types in the back, and as I take it out, Lapras comes in. It's pretty likely to be Lapras 7 or Lapras 8, the problematic sets, and I have to Psychic to scout. Lapras reveals Horn Drill, confirming my fear, and I Psychic again and dodge a sheer cold. So first off, I still don't know whether it's Lapras 7 or Lapras 8, but it's more likely to be Lapras 7, and here's why. Hariyama has four different sets, and two of them have Quick Claw, giving it a 50% chance to have Quick Claw. One other rule the opponents have to follow is Item Claws, meaning that if Hariyama had a Quick Claw, Lapras cannot also have a Quick Claw. So because of this information, and Lapras having two chances here to activate its potential Quick Claw, it is much more likely to be Lapras 7, the set with Rest and Sleep Talk. With this information, I decide to click Call Mind on a guaranteed Rest turn if it's Lapras 7, because either way, if I dodge an Oko move here from Lapras 8, I kill with the plus one Psychic. This also gives me much better initiative on Lapras 7, as Psychic couldn't KO here, only having a 4.4% chance to 3 hit KO on 3 hits. But now with the Calm Mind on Rest, I can 3 hit KO and hope for solid solid sleep talk luck from Lapras. So what happened here is absolutely hilarious. The AI will always use sleep talk while it's sleeping, but unlike a human, it doesn't know what turn it wakes up from rest, so we'll always use sleep talk on the turn it wakes up and the Lapras we lovingly call Casino Lapras is slayed. After this, I quickly dispatched the Articuno, swapped my Espeon for Salamence, declining the chance to have the Reggie Trio, and after some more wins, we made it to Noland 3. Noland here leads with Shift 3, and I swapped to Registeel in case it's Shift 3 or 4 clicking Explosion, while also covering Shift 3 2, which it ends up being. Shift 3 2 is a nasty set with Leech Seed, Dig, Double Team, and Rest, and I didn't want Salamence taking Leech Seed Chip if I didn't have to. I can intelligently stall this out by switching to Salamence whenever Shift 3 clicks Dig, and then going into Registeel once it tries the Leech Seed, because Registeel can rest off its Leech Seed damage, and use a struggling Shift 3 as an easy opportunity to set up all of my Curses and Amnesias. Once I did this, Nolan showed an absolute meme team as I destroyed Firo and Glalie in the back, and we are on to round 10. Round 10 was an absolute breeze. My draft was amazing, and I ended up picking an all-out attacking Ludicolo, a choice band Grand Bull, and a surprisingly good Latios 7. One usually thinks of Latios as a special attacker, but having Dragon Dance, Instant Recovery, and Earthquake makes for an ultra-deadly Pokemon. I decided to lead with Grand Bull to get big hits off right away and activate Intimidate to potentially allow for an instant Latios sweep, which it did multiple times this round, carrying me to the quickest round of this run that wasn't an early round. Coming off of the high that was round 10's draft was round 11's, which, besides the amazing Latias one, was filled with terrible Pokemon. So terrible that my best two options were legitimately this Sunny Day Solar Beam Earthquake x and a Registeel that only hits with Explosion and Ancient Power. After swapping for a Will-O-Wisp Destiny Bond Gardevoir, me and my awkward team find ourselves facing a normal type trainer with the battle style High Risk, High Return, and it's lead Gardevoir versus the lead Ursaring. This is probably the worst possible lead for me. I can't Will-O-Wisp the Ursaring, as instead of having its attack, I double it with its ability Guts, and Ursaring can have eight possible sets. I'm not guaranteed to 2 KO the Ursarings with Psychic, and many of them can instantly take me out. I also don't want to Destiny Bond on them, clicking Bulk Up from sets 7 and 8, so I make the play to go to Registeel to try to explode on it, but then... <laughs> Yes, that's right, it's Ursarang 6, also known as Freddy Fazbean, an ungodly set of Yawn, Double Team, Swords Dance, with its only attacking move being Hyper Beam, and its comeback with a vengeance after me passing it up on an earlier draft. Still, this is easily the worst case scenario for Registeel, as there's no chance I'm about to click Explosion and miss on the Double Team to Ursarang. What's also interesting about this Ursarang is that it guaranteed killed my Gardevoir with Hyper Beam, yet chose not to because the AI generally discourages recharge moves, considering them to be risky, especially at high HP. The play may seem to be go to Gardevoir and click Destiny Bond, but Ursaring could totally keep clicking Double Team, Swords Dance, and even Yawn, and I only have 5 chances to use Destiny Bond. 
combined with Hyperbeam's 10% chance to miss if they click it. Therefore, I had to waste turns by clicking counter and bring its HP down a little bit with Ancient Power, giving Freddy Fazbeam time to raise its stats and make it more likely to click Hyperbeam when Gardevoir came in. Gardevoir finally came in on perfect timing and dispatched Freddy Fazbeam with a Destiny Bond. I hope you can see how sketchily I have to play with this team. I beat the rest of their team and went on to win this round, along the way having a funny moment where I swapped for a Swagger Psych Up Metagross and proceeded to Psych Up an Omni Boost from, yes, the same Registeel we used that round. In round 12, I got a godlike Suicune, Suicune 2, able to 1v1 almost everything with a super intuitive set. You toxic the opponent, then do everything to not get hit, such as protecting, making yourself harder to hit with double team, or diving underwater. It's very powerful. It works especially well as a lead with protect, scouting out the opposing Pokemon set, and this is a godsend on a round where I have to face Noland 4. I paired this with an Explosion Weezing handling Grass and Poison types while giving me Boom, and passed up on waters like Lapras and Gyarados that made me too weak to Electric. You may think I could have taken this Doug Trio then, but without Choice Band, it's a terrible Pokemon, being one of the only Pokemon I've never used in the factory. So instead, I chose Hypno 4, also known as the Temptress or Tempter if it's male. I call Hypno 4 the Temptress because don't be fooled by its appearances. A Psychic type with Stab and Elemental Coverage? It's still a subpar Pokemon, as it is very weak, rather slow, and doesn't have overwhelming bulk. The reason Mons like Starmie and Gardevoir with great coverage like this work is because they're actually able to outpace most Pokemon that get hit by that coverage. Either way, Hypno can be on the team. Something interesting here is that the scientist said this trainer's battle style is impossible to predict. This is an extremely rare phase, as even though there only needs to be two moves to activate it, the only common move is Curse. And as I take down a Nidoking on lead and see Ampharos come in, I know for a fact it is either Trick Band Alakazam or Metronome Clefable in the back. This is because Nidoking has no sets with a Style 6 move on them, the 6 denoting impossible to predict and Ampharos lacks them as well. Trick Band Alakazam and Metronome Clefable are the only sets that can activate this phrase by themselves. Clefable, I won't ever lose to, so I have to prepare for the 50% chance Alakazam in the back. Suicune has a great matchup versus Alakazam, and Hypno as well, but the problem is Ampharos is on the field and has a great matchup versus Suicune. I want to switch directly to Weezing and Boom, keeping Suicune and Hypno for Alakazam, but if I get paralyzed by a Thunderbolt or a Thunder, or even critically hit, that could end the game. Therefore, I I decide to chip Ampharos with Dive and sacrifice the Suicune, guaranteeing the explosion kill even with Reflect Up, and now it's the Temptress versus what could be Choice Band Alakazam. Let's hope it's Clefable. Clefable's less scary, technically. It's Alakazam. All right, synchronized. I'm gonna Ice Punch because it does the most damage. They tricked me, sure. Sure. Big. Oh, they got me. Oh, baby. <sighs> No! Okay, they just can't crit. They just can't crit. I just can't get crit. This is not a mistake. They just can't get crit. No crit and I win. <sighs> please, man. Please, dude. Yes! <laughs> That's how you play Battle Factory. That's how you play Battle Factory. Going to wheezing on the Ampharos, my ass. With such a powerful Suicune set, I calculated my way through the rest of the round, swapping wheezing for Gengar, then Hypno for Metagross, then Gengar for Latios before facing off against Noland 4. Noland 4 brings out Electabuzz, so I click Protect to scout out its set. It clicks Thunder Wave, revealing itself to be Electabuzz 1 which lacks Ice Punch. So I can go to Latios, set up six Dragon Dances, and sweep his entire team. Dragon Dance Latios is such a beast, and we are on to round 13. Let's see what it is, 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 let's see what it is. What it is. <sighs> oh my god. <laughs> All right, you guys, you guys, I love this Gengar. I promise you, this is gonna be the real test. Is my Gengar 1 love justified? Here's what makes this Gengar so scary, you guys. Just look at the moves. And it could basically just eliminate the opponent from moving. The rest of the draft was pretty bad at round 13. Hilariously, all being set one Pokemon, meaning it's usually their worst set. But I decided on Gengar 1, 
Fortress, and Espeon. I decided to lead Gengar so I could use Confuse Ray and Hypnosis to set up my only win condition, Espeon, in the back. With the rest of the Pokemon in my draft being Poison and Psychic types, I felt I needed to go Fortress for its resists, and at least a somewhat okay matchup versus Latios. Yeah, that's a Latios. I am mega coping right now, and am forced to go into Fortress to scout what Latios this is. It clicks Thunder Wave, meaning it has to be Latios 5 or Latios 6. I am super hoping it's Latios 6, as I can actually 1v1 it with Fortress, but I light screen to play it safe, and the Dragon Claw roll reveals it's Latios 5, the Calm Mind Recover set. Help me. I need to go Espeon right now while light screen has 4 turns left and pray for a miracle. Latios gets paralyzed because I have Synchronize, and because I had Lumberry, it had to spend 2 turns paralyzing me, which paired with a full paralysis, I got to plus 6 Calm Minds while Latios only had 3. It's time to click Psychic. Oh. Yes. Spit off drop. Okay. Oh. No. <laughs> this, is, this is so cursed. I feel like I'm playing like RBYOU or something like that. Oh, crit. Crit, come on. Spit off drop. Yes. Spit off drop. This was amazing. I win the battle and I swap the garbage fortress for the Latios. And we are on to what would become the most cosmically unlikely Pokemon battle I have ever, ever, ever played. It's something I still fail to comprehend to this day. The battle was going great. I used a Flygon as Latios setup bait, took it and an Exploud out, but then... I think the Gen 3 Legendaries, they did such a good... Steel can't be Reggie Steel 2, which is kind of bad. Let's see how much I do. I bet I do a lot. More than half. Let's go. Oh no, that's pretty bad. Problem here. I'm just gonna declaw it here. I think that's always the play here. and then it dodges all 16 Dragon Claw crits. So I went to Gengar to confuse it and sleep it, then went to Espeon and try to win, but Registeel did this. Please stay asleep, bro. Ah. Oh my, of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. Oh my. Ah. Of course. Oh my god. Please, Gengar. Something magical. Oh? 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 That did nothing. Please don't wake up. Okay. Okay. Oh my god. Please hit hypnosis. Oh my god. Oh my god, there's no way. Please give it to me, man. I gotta, I gotta get a crit, man. No. <gasps> it's gonna snap out here no matter what. Miscounted? 
This is an unreal battle. This battle, this is, this is, this is genuinely so unreal right now. Oh, oh my goodness. Hypnosis and it's game over. Please, after a moment like that, Gengar. <laughs> what do you even say? What, like, what do you even... I... If there is a shadow of a doubt that you guys doubted Gengar 1, I hope you will always remember that Gengar 1 is the GOAT of Battle Factory. The odds of this were 0.00010599%, or 1 in 100,000. Gengar 1 had to overcome cosmic odds, but the stars aligned and the run continues. Sadly, I had to swap Gengar 1 for Registeel 1, as it's a much more solid Pokemon. And after some really cool stall scenarios that took me maybe an hour each to think and play through versus a Dusclops and a Snorlax, round 13 was in the bag. Round 14's draft had no standout Pokemon. I acquired a cool core of Lantern 3 and Flygon 4 in the back, but the most interesting pick was my lead of Shift 3 2, the Leech Seed set Noland used earlier. I had to swap Shift 3 for a Shuckle anyway as there was a Flying type trainer up next, but after that, I beat a Normal type trainer that brought the two scariest Normal types in Blissey and Snorlax. And as I swapped Shuckle, I got the devastatingly good Blissey 1. This Mon is so good because it gets free setup versus special attackers, and if a physical Pokemon comes in after, you likely have max evasion and can still Toxic plus Softboiled stall them, or even sing them. I swap Lantern for a Dusclops I just fought, forming the incredible Normal Ghost Core, and begin what would become the longest and most intense battle I've ever played. I encounter a Metagross lead, which I previously discussed during the stream, would be a nightmarish lead matchup. I had to go into Flygon to get Chip on it, and also let Dusclops take a huge hit while I revenge it with Earthquake. The disadvantages of a slow team are showing itself. Little did I know that this Vileplume, this Vileplume, would take almost two hours off my life. This was actually crazy, and again, probably the deepest interaction I've ever had in the Battle Factory. I know it can't be Vileplume 4 as the Metagross on lead had Quick Claw, which turns my attention to the other three sets. Vileplume 3 I can stall out by switch stalling Blissey and Dusclops. Vileplume 2 only threatens me with Toxic, but because my Blissey has Natural Cure, I can go into Blissey and then keep swapping in and out to make Vileplume run out of Toxics. And hilariously, I didn't even consider Vileplume 1 at this point, as no matter what, I had to go into Blissey for fear of toxic. Vileplume then clicks Petal Dance and misses revealing that it's Vileplume 1. Then, once Vileplume crit my Blissey with Sludge Bomb and poisoned it, I realized this was going to involve a lot of patience and calculating to get out of this alive. The main issue is that Blissey can't 1v1 Vileplume here. While I can stall out Sludge Bombs, Vileplume still wins the PP war as Petal Dance has 20 PP, which is multiplied by 2 or 3 because while it's in the middle of a Petal Dance, it doesn't use any. So Blissey would start struggling, and it doesn't even matter if Blissey beats the Vileplume. A struggling Blissey and a low health Dusclops have almost zero chance to beat a Pokemon in the back, so I had to use Dusclops to beat the Vileplume. Blissey here had to stall some sludge bombs and then sing to provide a free opportunity for Dusclops to come in and get some leftovers recovery, which also baits Petal Dance so Vileplume burns its Person Berry, a berry that heals confusion. I then have to sing again so Blissey can set up double teams to stall the rest of the sludge bombs so that Vileplume Petal Dances and confuses itself while I sing again so Dusclops can come back in to fire off a swagger. It was important to swagger after all the sludge bombs were gone so that Blissey wasn't dropping to a plus two sludge bomb. Of course, the Vileplume instantly woke up, so I had to go back to Blissey to repeat the process and preserve health on Dusclops, which was awkward as I had to use Toxic to preserve double teams and sings, and not use any soft boils, all while slowly losing health to Petal Dance. Either way, I got Dusclops back in only for Vileplume to dodge a swagger, so I had to swagger again giving Vileplume two Petal Dance hits. I then had to go back to Blissey and wait for it to confuse itself with Petal Dance and hopefully sing on that exact same turn so that I could go back into Dusclops with max sleep and confusion turns on the Vileplume and hopefully, hopefully, 
have time to psych up the plus two attack Vioplume while praying to God that I can beat whatever is in the back. Ha! Ah, to think my brain would get a break here, Swamper comes out, which is ultra scary. I have to sacrifice my Dusclops here and get chip damage with Shadow Ball, and it reveals itself to be Swampert 4 with its damage roll and Shell Bell item activation. And now, it's Blissey versus Swampert. I have to sing it to allow myself to set up double teams and minimize the chances Swamper can hit me with Earthquake, as I have only two soft boils versus its six remaining Earthquakes. It's a battle so intense, I'm just going to let the stream footage tell its story. No. Counter me. <sighs> no! No. <gasps> Bright powder! Oh my god. Bro, hit the sink, please, to God. Pussy, please. Just hit the sink. Hit the sink. Hit the sink. Hit the sink. Please, to God, just hit the sink. No! Oh my god, you're so stupid, Swampert. Oh. I got a double team. I got a double team right now. Oh my gosh. Do I toxic it? Hold on. No, I've got a double team. No, oh my gosh, I can't. I got a double team. I got a double team. I got a double team. Oh. Dude, this is this is an unreal battle. This is an unreal battle. Um, okay. I've got a double team. I've got a double team. Because Toxic doesn't matter when it gets Shell Bell recovery. I've got a double team. Please mirror coat me. No, stop, 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 stop. Oh, I thought that crit. Oh my gosh, I thought that crit. It's not gonna- it's gonna Earthquake, because it sees the kill. Oh! Oh! Why did it do that?! <sighs> I get hit with Earth- I just need to dodge two of these last four Earthquakes. Because I think I still- I still go on the same route. I have to double team again. Yes, I double team again. I double team again. I double team again. I double team again. Dude, I love you, Blissey One. Blissey One, you are the hero. Okay, that that's seven. That's seven. That's seven. Okay, okay, okay. That's seven. That's seven. That's seven. I don't win, so let's get that toxic off, man. Hit. Please mirror coat. 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 Oh my god, thank you, thank you, thank you. Double team time, baby. Double team time, baby. Double team time. Oh, I don't want to watch, I don't want to watch, I don't want to watch. Oh, dude, Blissey's HP moves so slow, I like have a... I just explode every single time, I don't know if it's gonna crit. I win on less crit. I win on less crit. I win on less crit. Yes! Yes! And as I swapped Dusclops for Metagross, my team became stupid good. The Beckon, the Beckon Pokemon. I'm swapping the Beckon Pokemon for the Iron Leg Pokemon. Yo, Metagross was the first Paradox Pokemon. You see that? Iron Leg. It was Paradox before anybody else was Paradox. And there weren't many other highlights of this round, except my Blissey humiliating a Gengar by winning with Struggle. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And we, my friends, are on round 15, man. In round 15, my draft luck continues. I'll show you what my team was through a pre Noland battle hype up, as the first six battles were pretty quick. The volcano Pokemon Entei. Thank you again, Andrew Capella. Really appreciate it. It's got pressure. This thing's gonna be pressure stalling stuff. It's the it's the calm mind resto chesto Entei. 31 IVs. This thing is a monster. Ah, help, guys. I'm weak to water types. What do I do if I'm weak to water types? Oh, I got a water absorb God Lapras, Surf, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, Psychic, Max HP, Max Special Attack. Also, 31 IVs. This thing is an absolute monster. 
It is great at cleaning up games because of its bulk and its coverage. It'll never be, you know, down. And then lastly, <clears throat> lastly, we got Gengar 7. Gengar 7, it's only three IVs. It's not gonna be doing as much as the others, but here's what it does. It doesn't offer any unique coverage, but here's something that it does do. It resists fighting for Entei and Lapras. It resists ground for Entei and Lapras. It resists normal for Entei and Lapras. And it gives me something that can trade down with Destiny Bond, which for the mons that Entei and Lapras are weak to is so, so huge. Let's do it, Noland. Let's go, you guys. Get hyped. Get hyped up. Okay, that's scary. Objectively. That's okay. Kingdra, nasty lead for me to deal with. Kingdra is a scary Pokemon when its set is unknown. Two of them are special attacking oriented, and the other two are nasty dragon dance sets. Thankfully, I have the perfect tools to scout and respond to whatever Kingdra this is. Lapras comes in on Kingdra 1 or Kingdra 2 clicking their water move, but instead, the Kingdra clicks dragon dance, revealing either an indoor flail set or a resto chesto double edge set. After I ice beam and switch to Gengar in case double edge, and then go back to Lapras where it clicks ice beam, revealing Kingdra 4. I can perfectly stall this out of ice beams and double edges by constantly switching between Lapras and Gengar. Once it was out of attacking moves, I did something genius. I purposely fire punched it with Gengar every time Gengar was on the field, as Kingdra would only click rest seeing that it was already at max stats with Dragon Dance and Gengar is immune to double edge. I then switched into Entei, then into Lapras, and back into Gengar on the turn Kingdra wakes up, rinse and repeat. The reason I make the mid sleep switch of Entei is that it saves PP on my Lapras's and Gengar's moves. You never know when you'll need it. I then went to Entei and proceeded to set up max double teams and max call mines, purposefully flamethrowing in between the sequence so that Kingdra would spend two more turns sleeping from rest. If I didn't do this, Kingdra would struggle before I could set up my stats, and a plus six struggle critical hit could end my Entei. After this sequence succeeded, Entei showed that he got that dog in him and destroyed Vaporeon and Ursaring, defeating the last Noland I needed to obtain the world record. In round 16, my amazing draft luck continued, with a draft of Suicune, Latias, and Choice Band Armaldo. Suicune lead makes sense in case I need to roar to scout a threat, and I'm comfortable using it as a lead in general. Latias is a Latias, even if it's a quirky set and provides a crucial pivot and answer to grass and electric types. And lastly, Armaldo is clearly the best choice here, giving me the immediate punch versus Blissey and Snorlax, and even Latios that my team needs. A part of me didn't like keeping Armaldo in the back, as Armaldo was o has only a single resistance and is rather slow, meaning it doesn't like switching into attacks, but it was too crucial to save it in the back for the previously mentioned threats to Suicune and Latias. On the second battle, Armaldo clutched versus a Latios, and I made a fun Funny decision to swap my Armaldo for a Latios, because the upcoming trainer specialized in the water type. The Latios had the exact same set as my Latios, and was only 3 IVs, and made me weaker versus the satanic water Oko trio of Walrein, Lapras, and Dugong, but I needed to make myself as strong as possible versus the rest of the water types, with Armaldo only helping with the previously mentioned trio, and set up double edge mons like Kingdra 4 and Waylord 2. This is gonna be a tough one. This is gonna be a tough one. All right, expert Emma. Oh, all right, man. I got a roar. Oh. Okay, whatever. Pressure, 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 pressure. Oh, let's get a crit dodge, please, bro. Come on, come on, come on. Crit dodge, spin up drop, something. Yes. Okay. <sighs> come on, man. No! Oh my god, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you scare me so much, Walrein. Kill it, please! Yes! Yes! I hate you, Walrein. Anyway, we win the battle and find ourselves facing another water ice type later in the round. Alright, well this is scary. Um, 
The type and phrase for this battle was water type, no battle style, meaning it could really be any of the Lapras's. I did risk taking an ice beam here, but decided to play it aggressive and psychic it in case it was an Oko Lapras, which of course it was. After I see this, I decide to psychic again for Chip, dodge another sheer cold, and at this point, I still don't know if it's Lapras 7 or Lapras 8. Similar to the Espeon situation before, I decide to Shadow Ball it to fish for a special defense drop in case it's Casino Lapras and rests, which of course it is. This could totally end my run, as my Suicune and Tentacruel 100% loose, with Casino Lapras having access to Sheer Cold and Horn Drill, and the demonic item Lepaberry, restoring the PP of a move without any. This, on top of Sleep Talk not using the PP of its Oko moves, makes this an automatic win versus my Pokemon in the back. I fire off one Psychic, and then this happens. How about you don't have Shell Armor and I get a crit, man? Man, yes! Casino Lapras was taken down by quite the stroke of luck, and I actually ended up swapping for it over my previously swapped for Tentacruel. Using an Oko only Pokemon might seem dubious, but this Lapras absolutely destroys most water types and gives me a great answer to Snorlax and Blissey, the biggest threats to my team. Either way, we now find ourselves facing the final trainer of round 16. Difficult? Listen up, I always win. All right, we'll see about that. All right, all right, Tobe. Toby, I listened, I listened, I listened to you, Toby, and, uh, okay. Suicune here outpaces two of the four possible Zapdos sets, and because the slower Zapdoses are likely to click Thunder Wave, and I have Lum, I think there is huge upside to staying in and clicking Ice Beam, as none of the Zapdoses can even KO me. Yeah, so this was terrible. I was forced to go into Latias, getting paralyzed and chipped by Drill Peck, and then... Please don't give me something stupid, bro. I don't even know what to say, man. This is okay though, as I had a beautiful realization. The scientist before the battle told us that the opponent's battle style was slow and steady. On the spreadsheet, these are style two moves. Unlike previous battle styles like high risk, high return, and impossible to predict, the opponent needs three moves in this category, as opposed to two. We know it's Zapdos 1 as it outpaced Suicune and clicked Thunderbolt. The only other Zapdos that outpaces uses Thunder. And Zapdos 1 has a slow and steady move and a Lumberry. Looking at Starmie's sets now, we know it can't be Starmie 3, 4, or 5, as they all have Lumberry, so it's extremely likely to be Starmie 1 or 6, as they have two slow and steady moves, completing the phrase. I've got a hope for the best case scenario of Starmie 6, as my Lapras has Water Absorb, totally walling it, and it clicks Confuse Ray, then Thunder Wave, and then recovers. This confirms that it's Starmie 6, because here Starmie guessed that I am Water Absorb, so refrained from clicking at Surf. This was amazing, but I still had to play this optimally, as while I guaranteed beat this Starmie, I wanted to set myself up optimally for whatever the third Pokemon was in the back. My end goal was to have a, my Latias take zero damage and have my Lapras in, not paralyzed, asleep, or confused versus the last Pokemon. To do this, I switch stalled between Latias and Lapras to stall out Confuse Ray and Thunder Wave, but only switched Lapras out once I saw Starmie recover on Lapras, or use Surf, giving it the knowledge that I was water absorbed. This ended up working perfectly as I landed a Horn Drill on the Starmie and cleaned up the Venusaur in the back with Latias, and we are on to round 17. Dude, this is like the most important draft of my life. I'll just cut to the chase. This was absolutely amazing. My draft ended up being Suicune, Mr. Mime, and Weezing. Mr. Mime proved insanely clutch here as a lead, tricking its choice band versus passive threats, allowing Suicune to come in, set up, and steamroll opponents. And it all leads up to battle 119. I want to enjoy this battle. I do too. I do too, because this is the tie, the world record of a facility, a thing that has been in one of the most iconic Pokemon games ever. 20 years, I could tie the world record in one of the facilities in its Battle Frontier. That's Pokemon history, I'm excited. Venusaur, bye. Bye, Venu. Oh, I don't actually kill Venusaur too as well. Hold on, what a... 
What in the world? Yo, wait, hold on. I don't even kill. I still just psychic psychic. I'm not gonna trick it into choice band sludge bomb. That would be absurdly terrible. I'm not playing around. Okay, that killed. Okay. We're up. That's good. I've got a trick, Reggie Steel. I can't let this set up. I cannot let this be that amnesia set and set up. So I've got to switch. i got to go to Espeon, then back to Mime. I'm going Espeon and then back to Mime. Okay, it's Reggie Steel 1. Back to Mime. It cursed. Okay. Let's trick this thing. Look, another setup move. I know what this is. Is it not just the best thing ever? It's just that easy sometimes. It really is. After it clicks curse here, it'll click curse six more times. When I switch Suicune in on the next six turns, what I want to do is what is the most optimal way that I set up my Suicune in six turns? Alright, that's curse. However, because the curse move when it's a ghost type targets the opponent, does it is it affected by pressure? There's no way it is, right? No. It's it's still not. It's still not affected by pressure. I mean, I don't even know what to say if this happens, man. Nice roll. Give me a nice roll. Give me a nice juicy roll, Suicune. I'm a happy guy. What can I say? I'm a happy guy. What can I say? I got nothing else to say. I'm just a happy guy right now. Oh my god. I don't even need to think. Goodbye. Nice son. Goodbye. The Charizard that ended my 113 streak. Wow, that's poetic. Hold on a second. Can we just realize this? For all of you guys that didn't know, Charizard 1 is the Pokemon that ended my 113 streak. And it came out at the last moment to tie the world record to remind me, hey, I'm here, but you've conquered that. You've conquered that misplay. Because I thought that a Starmie was faster than a, was faster than a Charizard. And the Charizard came in at the last moment to be like, Logan, this is how you have leveled up past that misplay you made all that time ago. How poetic. I'm, you, can you get more poetic than that? You can't get more poetic than that. As I'm doing this voiceover, it's surreal looking back at this moment. First off, to explain what happened with the curse pressure interaction, let's read what Dark Antimatter on Smogon found out about it. He says, The cause seems to be that changing the move's target from the opponent, as is the default for curse, to the user when they're not a ghost type only happens when the player selects the move in the actual menu. So when the AI uses curse, this check is neglected and the opponent is always considered to be the target, meaning it's affected by pressure. This means that during human versus human battles, this won't happen because we are always selecting our target. That's just so crazy. And I think keep your horns on put it best when he said, can't effing believe 119 could have been lost on a crit due to a curse pressure mechanic that you even suspected, but it just wasn't documented anywhere because it's so insanely niche that no one would ever run into it in any other circumstance. Like what the actual F are the odds that would come out in such a big way on the exact battle of that tied world record? LMAO, I can't imagine how astronomically unlikely that is. Thank God Struggle didn't crit here. So, as I entered round 18, I had to talk real quiet because it was close to midnight and a resident next door was trying to sleep. So I'm gonna have to do more voiceover for this. TLDR, my draft was insane. 
I got maybe the best lead in the game, Gardevoir 5. With a powerful Psychic and access to Endure plus Salic Berry and Destiny Bond, Gardevoir can get into many scenarios where it takes out two Pokemon. Combine this with an Explosion and Executor, and I could win many games this way. The real kicker of this draft, though, was getting a bulky Dragon Dance Resto Chesto Gyarados, the God Set Gyarados 4. This is exactly what I needed for a round featuring a Noland that no battler has ever faced. But first, we must face Cool Trainer Miriam for the world record, and oh boy, she has a Latios. Latios' likely Bolt Beam coverage is devastating for my Gyarados and Executor, so I plan to Shadow Ball, Shadow Ball, then endure into Salic Berry and Shadow Ball again to take any Latios out. Then I can Destiny Bond on whatever comes in and explode with Exeggutor. So I Shadow Balled the Latios, and from that damage and the damage it did to me with Dragon Claw, I suss out that it's Latios 4. Latios with Bolt Beam coverage. I now considered clicking Destiny Bond just to play around a critical hit, leaving my Gyarados and Exeggutor versus the two Mons in the back, but decide the upside of keeping Gardevoir alive was too big. Plus, landing a critical hit is a 1 in 16 chance. There's no way that can happen, right? That did not, that, there's, there's, I don't, I don't even know what the, I don't even. I can't even put into words how much this sunk me. I was now forced to go into Exeggutor to hopefully not get crit by Ice Beam or Frozen, or explode, and hope that Gyarados 4 can 1v2 whatever is in the back. That's not good though, this could rock slide me. I mean, I've got a DD, so it's always DD turn one, so let's just see what happens after that. Please don't be the stupid Thunder Punch of a champ, I'm gonna flip. Uh... Okay, okay. There's no other play. There's no resting. I just got a frustration. Frustration does more. Um, doesn't matter. I'm not just gonna earthquake. Doesn't matter. The mood swing, you guys. The mood swing is real. Oh, that makes me so happy. Oh my gosh, you guys. I got it. 